All right, so first of all, well, thank you very much, um, Verena Schwarz, for, uh, for inviting me to the, the summit of, of new thinking, and especially to this, uh, this open realities track. Um, my name is Steven Kovacs. I, among other things, used to be the artistic director of the Transmediale Festival, the Festival for Art and Digital Culture here in Berlin. Um, many of my previous lives have been dealing with architecture and urbanism and I left the Transmediale last year to basically fuse um, ideas related to um, open cultures, open technologies, uh, media, architecture and urbanism. And so what I'd like to um, share with you today um, is a project which is very much at its beginning, it's in its, in its infancy, um, and it's a project for which I would like to have also your input, um, and hopefully at a certain point also your, your participation. Um, some of the people who are involved in the project in one way or another are also here, so Geraldine thanks that, that you, could, uh, you could make it, and, uh, and Georgia over here somewhere. Um, yeah, the project is called um, OS Juba. OS Juba stands for Open Source City Juba, basically Open Source Capital City uh, Juba. And this, this first image here is uh, just the piece of propaganda that we had for um, a first brainstorming on this idea back in June at the supermarket on, uh, on Brunnstrasse. Um, the, uh, the idea evolved um, through a number of discussions that I had with um, people like Klaas Glenewinkel, who's the, the head of an organization called MICT, M-I-C-T, that's Media and Cooperation and Transition. M-I-C-T has been working in Sudan and South Sudan for very many years, um, basically training uh, journalists, independent journalists, independent media. They work in crisis and post-crisis uh, regions to basically pr promote uh, free, free expression. And we had this discussion about open source and the role that open source plays in the whole development industry, let's say, international uh, development, and what the possibilities or plausibilities could be for an open source model to be used in helping to create the, the contours of this new state, South Sudan. So this, uh, this event in June, open sourcing, or the world, the, asking the question, is this the world's first open source city? Could it be? Um, was very much this question about how open source and post-conflict development could work. Um, it was... Somehow my computer has slowed down. Anyways, um, the event gathered together a number of, of people from Berlin's um, open source and strategic media um, communities, but also people from um, international open source organizations such as Ushahidi um, in Nairobi, as well as um, from the Honf organization in Indonesia. Um, German federal government uh, was there and some larger um, so-called donor organizations. So all of a sudden it was clear that there is some kind of an interest in actually discussing the subject which for a lot of us here is somehow um, pretty straightforward. I mean it's kind of kind of obvious. I don't need to uh, you know spend too much time on why the open source model is, is perhaps a good one. Um, but just the, no, the, the, the basic understanding of what open source is, um, what open technologies are, um, let's say moving into also the realm of open data and open hardware, uh, is something which is hardly uh, discussed in the real world of international um, development. And um, I just we have this strange Vorführ effect here. This was all working. So here we are now uh, today at the summit of new thinking, which is about um, open open strategies. And the project has come to the point now that we've been invited to go to Juba um, in December to have a first meeting with 
um, the government of South Sudan with um, players in the in the field of international development in Juba as well as civil society um, um, uh, leaders in in Juba and basically we're we're designing this project right now as we speak and f that's of course one of the reasons to be here today it's what what c that could be so I'll just give a, f a little bit of background to South Sudan and and to to Juba um, South Sudan is a, is a relatively large country that became independent in 2011 um, it uh, it broke off from Sudan, so what is now I guess the northern part, the rump uh, Sudan, after about 40 years of, of, uh, of civil war. And it's a country that is facing, um, of course, massive challenges. It faces the challenges of its own economic development, issues of poverty, of course, issues of education, but it also has um, the challenge of defining itself um, in the international context. Um, very few people know about this state, about this country, and there is no clear unifying cultural identity in the state. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a multi-ethnic, multi multicultural state made up of ten, ten different provinces, which all has a very distinct um, cultural, cultural identity. And it's, um, in, in the statistics, um, some of the things which is interesting for us as we start to research this project is that a good three quarters of the population is under 30. Um, and only about a quarter of the population is actually literate. And of course, of that quarter of that, uh, of, or of that uh, number, um, the vast majority are males. So there's a scenario also of incredibly low um, literacy rates amongst uh, women and girls. And this presents also some, some interesting challenges, but also um, a lot of opportunities for doing things in, in, a different, uh, in a different kind of way. Um, Juba itself, the capital, um, was, was chosen amongst a number of uh, small regional uh, capitals in the southern part of, uh, of, uh, of, of Sudan. Um, it's a city which has grown enormously. It was the fastest growing um, urban center in the world in between 2009 and 2011. Basically, it had to go from being this little dusty uh, uh, capital uh, to the capital of a, of a, new, a new country. And um, Juba today is somewhere in between all these things. So it's between this, this sort of dusty provincial place and a place that wants to be um, capital of this, this new country. And these changes which are going on in Juba in the urban and architectural sense are happening um, at an outrageously um, fast pace. As part of the development of the project, I had the opportunity to go there um, a few weeks ago. And um, the, the contrasts and the scenarios in this city um, were, um, were also very interesting. So I'll just show a couple of quick images from that. This is a typical, typical street scene in the middle of uh, Juba, so primarily residential area. And you've got the, the small scale, um, let's say, typical South Sudanese um, houses, and then these villas that have been built for a large part by the South Sudanese diaspora who has been coming back or has come back uh, to South Sudan. Most of the streets are not paved. There's a few, um, a few streets that are sort of main thoroughways through the city which are paved and almost all the new architecture or almost all the new building anyways which is being done um, in uh, Juba and across South Sudan is is being done with um, 
uh, shipping containers that have been adapted. So there's um, there's there's fancy ones that are already like set up as uh, as offices. And basically, the whole city is an is an accumulation, um, an aggregate of various ways of building with containers. So there's some quite cute little cottagey examples, uh, like this one down here. This is actually on the campus of the University of Juba, and um, this is um, a restaurant. Um, which is made up of of those uh, containers stacked up, but it's been sheathed in, um, in in bamboo sticks, so to to give it sort of like the shine or the the appearance of um, something completely different. So there's very creative ways of dealing with this kind of um, scenario, and it's also in itself uh, a very kind of open and, and modular kind of uh, situation. Um, but the city is booming. Um, there's there's new construction going up all over the place. Nobody knows exactly uh, for what. There's sort of like unnamed uh, buildings, a lot of office buildings um, happening. There's um, the, the 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 kind of thing that one sees in these in these rapid uh, development contexts of um, yeah, the resolution here is not so okay. No. Okay. Okay. Well, this um, I just wanted to show this this ad here, but we can't really see it. It's it's about the future. So everything is about looking into the future, about the the power of of beer uh, for the future. There's there's huge um, advertisements um, in the city, and there's there's a huge mixture of of, of informal and formal uh, structures happening um, in, this, in this place. Um, as I said, it's the, now the largest urban center um, in South Sudan. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a population of about, well, less than 300,000. Now it's over 1.3 um, million. And um, this transition from a tiny provincial hub with limited infrastructure and services to the world, uh, to the to being servicing for world's capital is perhaps the greatest single challenge that the city itself has. Um, so where the project began as a as an idea about open source urbanism, we were primarily interested in in the functions of the city as a capital city. It's of course a different kind of scenario than. Um, a regular urban center, a capital city, has to provide the framework also for the state to function. And within these scenarios of frameworks for a state to function, you start looking at um, urbanism actually as a, as, a, um, as a function of state building itself. So the project is in a phase right now of actually looking at much larger picture of the way in which open source can actually function um, with the kernel of a capital city as a framework building thing for the whole uh, for the whole state so we start looking at methodologies at processes and the very kinds of structures and let's say the um, the forms of sustainability and the forms of collaborative enterprise that exist within open source as a function for state building. The, the models which we are used to, um, let's say in the West or in Europe, about open source urbanism, which are like super high-tech models of, of data efficiency and traffic control and all that kind of stuff, are not at all the kinds of things that we are talking about um, in Juba or within the the project for, for South Sudan. We're looking really very much at the ideas that are behind open source and how these can be adapted and adopted in other contexts of transformation and implementation of new uh, forms of methodologies. Um, it's also very much um, in, the, in the spirit of creative hacktivism. Um, the, this a statement from Richard M. Stallman that hack f hacking is about clay playful cleverness, so not about breaking or destroying, um, but really about creating something new out of things that have been broken open is, is, uh, is, is fundamental. And it's 
also a lot about enabling access, access to information, access to data, access to technologies in all realms of, uh, of, of, of society and inter interplay between, let's say, the government um, and, uh, and the public. So the project um, is, um, is dealing um, at its core right now um, with how to define and how to structure um, situations of open data, open knowledge, and basically public domain info so that the people who are actually um, building a livelihood that are trying to use um, the, um, I guess, the euphoria that independence brought, how can they use this material that's in the public domain to actually create livelihoods without absolutely having to rely just on uh, donor countries, on donor organizations, or at least how can one create a form of collaboration that actually is sustainable so that these kinds of um, open structures can, um, can be used. So this is very much about creating spaces, spaces of exchange, spaces for collaboration, for sustainability, um, it's very much about creating scenarios in which there's accountability and transparency and also participation in the public process. South Sudan is ostensibly a, um, a democracy. They have had uh, relatively free and fair and, and violence-free um, elections. But there's no real understanding about how that whole system, how that structure works or why it should even be uh, used. Um, and there are elements within the government who kind of want to keep it that way. You know, we'd rather not let people know like how these things should be working, but there are elements in the government that actually want um, openness and accountability because they recognize that that, um, that contract, let's say, between government um, and civil society is essential in order to secure the future of the country and not end up being um, a failed state. Um, so there's, there's enormous potential um, to enable various forms of opportunity. We just need to find the mechanisms um, to, to do that and to find the right partners within South Sudan, within the government, um, for that as well. Um, how are we doing with, with time? Is that, just because... Okay. Just let me know when we're like five minutes before. Okay. Um, there's, some, there's a number of organizations um, in Africa, primarily, who, who are dealing with these concepts, who are working with these concepts um, in, um, I guess one could say, innovative and uh, very forward-thinking and collaborative uh, means. There's, um, there's the whole so, um, network of, of so-called iHubs, so innovation um, and technology hubs, often uh, um, focused at uh, or focused towards youth um, and, and getting youth involved um, in very hands-on uh, ways with technology. There's also the project uh, called um, Ice Addis, which is itself just a node within a, a larger uh, so-called ICE network, ICE standing for innovation, collaboration and entrepreneurship. Um, the Ice Addis hub in, in Addis Abeba in Ethiopia um, is working together with the University of Juba to, to set up one of these innovation, collaboration and entrepreneurship nodes um, in Juba. And, um, and this is also very much a part of the, the project. Very important is this um, is the collaboration also, I mentioned it earlier, between uh, the diaspora um, and the people who have been living and working and surviving in South Sudan for the past 20, 30, 40 years. Um, there was considerable friction between, let's say, all the Sudanese, the South Sudanese who had lived outside the country, coming back at the time of independence and sort of telling everybody else this is, this is the way it should be done. A lot of resistance uh, to that. Um, this resistance has been turning more and more into actual um, useful collaboration um, in the past months or maybe in the, in the past year, the first year of, of independence. And South Sudan has started to set up embassies around the world and we're very lucky here in Berlin uh, to have um, 
one of the very few female uh, ambassadors from South Sudan, uh, Sitona Abdullah Osman. She's one of those people who also has great vision um, for the country. She herself um, has been working for many decades in, um, in, in the realm of, of creating um, opportunity and education um, to help solve the problem of uh, primarily female uh, illiteracy and um, the project is very much tied in to the work that people are doing outside of the country like Ambassador Satona here in Berlin together with the actual government in uh, South Sudan. Um, at the, same, at the same time, South Sudan is also um, starting to draft bills which will allow, hopefully, um, certain forms of open structures, open access, access to information to actually happen. Um, there is right now um, a draft bill for the right of access to information. There's also a media bill which is meant to regulate the media, which we're not quite sure yet if that's actually a good thing or a bad thing, but at least it's, it's an attempt to set up rules at which um, um, clear distinctions can be, be made so that the problem of, uh, of the police or the government just kind of shutting you down for no reason uh, whatsoever should be, should be eliminated. Whether that works or not is, is another thing. Um, but what's interesting is that in, this, in the discussions that are taking place in South Sudan um, about, for example, the right to access, um, there is very little connection to um, what to do when you have access to information. So again, we, we land directly in the scenario of we've been given legislation to access information but we don't talk about open data or what open information is available and how it can be used. Um, so one of the, the, the partners in the project, uh, Ushahidi, which is a, a software company based in, uh, in Nairobi, um, they've been uh, very active um, in Africa and around the world in, in, in terms of also providing very straightforward um, examples of what citizens can do with, with their own data and with available data. Um, their, their primary, um, I guess, product are uh, um, crowd, crowdsourcing platforms, so um, let's say statistical analysis that can be graphed um, to show certain kinds of trends. They do election monitoring, they do crisis management, but they also have projects that, that uh, anybody can, uh, can use. Um, there's one about um, kids and or, or people in Serbia following sort of like who has guns and who doesn't. So it's a huge range of things and um, yeah, we'll move on from there because then we get into a whole other area which we don't have time for. Yeah, so changing the way information flows um, in the world, that's their, that's their headliner. Um, of course, Ubuntu is also fundamentally um, important just as an example, one, one of very many um, open source solutions or platforms or softwares, um, because we find also scenarios that organizations are operating um, with, let's say, proprietary software, completely unlicensed, one could say illegal. Um, so, are there alternatives to that kind of scenario that then also save money in a, in a place that has uh, to be um, um, more effective, let's say, with the money that they have or, or don't have? For this, organizations like the Free Software and Open Source Foundation for Africa are incredibly important. Um, FOSFA, um, this is a very strong network. Um, within Africa that has chapters in just about every country, every location um, in Africa, not yet in, in South Sudan. Um, and these kinds of organizations are important because they, they provide a kind of a peer structure. So when you, you talk to people in South Sudan, in the government, about ideas behind open source, and open data, open systems, um, often there's, there's a fear. There's a fear of 
of, of the open, a fear of being, um, let's say, of having people peer in too closely to what you're actually doing without actually realizing that um, these kinds of mechanisms and the, materi the materiality that uh, is being worked with is actually already part of the public domain or actually belongs to the citizens that should be using it. So organizations like the Free, uh, the, of, like FOSFA, um, they, they provide this kind of peer structure so that also governments um, can um, discuss these, pro these problems at a much higher, um, a much higher level. There are organizations, again, this is one based here in Berlin, but operating um, internationally, which are also um, interesting elements within a project like um, this for, for South Sudan called um, Open Oil. Open Oil is um, it's basically a consultancy which is looking at and developing um, I guess you could call it solutions for how to open up the oil industry. A lot of the problems that exist within um, oil-based uh, economies or, or strong resource-based economies is, for example, um, there's absolutely no transparency between the, con the, the level of where the contracts are and where the money is going and what it's being used for. And in a state like South Sudan, which ostensibly um, gets 98% of its revenue from oil, not knowing what the contract says about the oil is, is kind of a, you know, it's a serious, serious problem. It's a serious issue. Um, so Open Oil, uh, which has just released the South Sudan Oil Almanac, um, is an organization which is basically working also, I suppose, through peer pressure um, and outside pressure to make these contracts um, open so that, for example, the finance minister even might know what kind of income is being generated in the country. Because if the finance minister doesn't get the material or the information coming from the contracts, which is often the case, he also can't or she also can't uh, plan for the development of, uh, of the country. Um, there are a number of other projects, there's very many. This is one, uh, one example um, coming from uh, a participant who will be in, uh, in Juba in December, um, Eugenio Ticelli. He's a Mexican-based uh, uh, artist, programmer, and creative hacker. Um, he has, for example, um, a software called uh, Ojo or Oyo uh, Voz, um, which is a, an, an Android um, platform, open source um, software um, for sending images and voice messages from your telephone to the web. It's a fairly straightforward idea, um, but the point is that he's developing this software very specifically for, um, let's say, lowest threshold technology use in scenarios where um, access to technology is limited, but the necessity to share information, to share data, is extremely high. So um, his project, uh, Sautia Vakulima, the voice of the farmers, is one of these projects um, happening in Tanzania where um, farmers in a certain district or in a province are, uh, are on, a, on a regular basis recording um, images, stories, interviews, videos and so on um, about the effects of climate change on their crops. Um, this is of course a big issue. There's the one discussion that says there is no real climate change happening and of course there's the people on the ground who actually do see these changes from season to season. So how do you, how do you create an empirical scenario for, for tracking uh, those changes, for example, and how do you discuss and exchange information about it? So this, that's what this, this project is about. And it's a project that was also started off with funding by various agencies and so on, but is now running completely independently. So it has found that balance between use of technology um, the minimally available resources and the need for that technology to actually function on its own. So it's no longer um, just, let's say, a product of um, international funding organizations, but it, but it has found a use um, 
within the community and um, with the with the farmers who are who are using it. Um, you can also download it yourself if you can scan this or just uh, Google Ojo Oyo Voz if you want to try it out. Um, another very interesting um, project organization or network um, is the group behind Open Source Ecology. Um, they're working, let's say, on the open hardware side of things. Open Source Ecology also deals primarily with the agricultural sector, but not just. And basically what they're doing is they're building machines that are based completely on open source uh, plans. Um, their, their goal, I suppose, is to create the so-called Global Village Construction Set. And um, as a practical example, um, they have, for example, a, um, um, a system for an open source tractor. Uh, the plans for this tractor are freely available. They can be downloaded, printed, um, as one wishes. And the, the pieces, the materials for building this tractor are elements which are found in most, if not all, uh, places around the world. They can be built out of local materials. They can be um, built in such a way um, that, let's say, spin-off economies can be built for the procurement and the servicing of these machines. It also means that the tractor which is built in India looks completely different from the one that is maybe being built in Kenya, which is different than the one that's being built in the States. The point is that all the tractors actually function um, and they can be built um, in, um, in, in, a, in, 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 a, in, a, in certain cases at least, in a much faster way than a normal procurement scenario is happening where, for example, a shipment of, of tractors is being bought from China or the States or even Germany and they arrive and the first time they break down um, you don't have the right parts for them and the thing won't work anymore and they end up on the on the scrap heap. So again, it's, a, it's an example of of, 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 a, of a form of sustainability within this open source context. So this is a graph um, about that, but how are we doing with time? We're kind of at the end, okay. Um, then I will just, I will zip, I will zip through this and I'll just um, wrap up because I would like to have your, um, your comments. Um, just going back to the actual process, so the actual structure um, in, the, in the urban context of, of the OS Juba project, um, there's, there's, there's three very simple and very straightforward ideals. Um, these, were out, these particular ones were outlined by uh, the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, and that is the requirement of input by all stakeholders and affected citizens, including outsiders with innovative ideas. This is important because often these processes of development happen in very closed environments. There's the requirement of participatory governance and decision making for the final outcome. And the requirement that this accumulated knowledge be put into knowledge commons for future use and remixing in other projects. So these are three very fundamental rules um, or at least scenarios that can be adapted um, also for education projects. It can be adapted in accumulating information about healthcare and health systems. Um, it's just um, a kind of a straightforward guide from which one can uh, create um, other forms of, let's say, sustainable and open uh, development. So we're right in the middle of preparing this, this event, the first event, which is going to be around this issue of, of um, so-called open knowledge and sustainable development. It will be in Juba, um, in South Sudan, from the 11th to the 13th of uh, December. It's, uh, it's in collaboration with this organization, MICT, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, their part is going to be very much about how open structures can support uh, the independent media, the development of independent media. The other side of the event is going to be very much about how the reality of this open source model can actually function in the state. So can this actually be done? Can we really create uh, this open source uh, model as a, as a state 
uh, structure. We have some very interesting people coming. Dorothy Gordon, for example, she considers herself a liberation technologist committed to ensuring that Africa has the capacity to create and implement ICT solutions um, for sustainable human development. Um, and these guests are coming together with um, experts and actors uh, working in in South Sudan, in Juba, um, in setting up this scenario for for a new uh, state. And if we can do it using an open source model, um, then we're really super happy. So um, that's it for this very very quick uh, fly through. Um, I appreciate your 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 patience. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch with me, that's my name, my email address, and my, my Twitter account. Um, I'm here, we're here in our small team. I would really love to have uh, your input for the continuation of the project. Also within the, the, um, the event that we will be doing in, in Juba, I'm hoping that we'll have um, some interesting and structured feedback sessions early next year when we get back. So, questions, statements, please, it's open to you. And if not, there's one guy. Can you come up uh, and get a mic? Because there's this, there's this incredible sort of like a wall of silence here. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. This is a really inspiring project. Um, I'm just curious, uh, one of the challenges that uh, open governance has faced when it's been tried in other places, like the United States, can you hear me? Yeah, speak into the mic, but talk loud as well. I'm I sorry. One of the challenges that open governance has faced in other places where it's been tried, like in the United States, for example, is that transparency can sometimes expose problems or even in some cases corruption, um, but often we lack the means to actually take meaningful action to, to correct them. So I'm just wondering if you've kind of anticipated this, this challenge and, and how you might address it. Well, this is this is actually what I meant, you know, by that fear factor. Um, you know, um, at, at, on the one hand, um, it, of course, it depends on which official you talk to. I mean, some actually do want to use these scenarios for uh, for eliminating uh, corruption, for uncovering corruption. Others don't really want to talk about that, but they, they like the idea of providing data in as efficient a way as possible so that people can use it for economic development, for example. So um, I don't have like a real clear you know, solution really, but how to deal with that fear factor other than just going with, um, let's say, the best case examples uh, and positive scenarios. Um, of course, the, the issues in the States are, are very different than they are here in, in Europe and, and, of course, somewhat different also than in South Sudan. Um, but one of the, one of the more interesting, um, I guess, organizations or networks is the, um, the Open Government um, Partnership, of which some African countries like Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa um, are leaders in. And the Open Government Partnership is, again, I guess one of these kind of global peer pressure groups that you can actually, on a policy level and a government level, talk about the positive elements of, 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 of open data and open government um, without, let's say, worrying about um, what will happen if mm, the embarrassing stuff uh, gets out. Because you can see that in Tanzania it's actually working and in Kenya it's actually uh, working. So it's important to basically to also have that dialogue started. So even the, the discussion, uh, the, the very basic discussion itself has to be, uh, has to be opened up. And, um, and just sort of dealing basically with that fear, that fear factor is the biggest, biggest challenge probably. Okay. So I'm around. I think we probably have to get on to the next speaker. So again, thanks. And uh, thanks to the organizers as well for letting me do this. Cheers.